Well, today's uh, today's topic is an extenuation extenuation. That's a that's a, that's a mashup. Um, is a continuation of a series that we've been working on. So so we're gonna do uh, dynamic wall generation and particle effects today, right? Right, and we'll do we'll have enough time to handle the logic for restarting the game when you collide with the wall. Sweet. Okay, let's do that. All right. So uh, let me go ahead and launch here. You can see my screen already. What we're looking at here is basically where we left off last week. I've got the game running but paused. Uh, if I were to release it, the uh, player would move and run into the wall. Let's just see if I can do that. So momentarily, boom. It runs into the wall. We're done. So uh, last week, this is where we left off. Now, of course, we could start steering. But we will quickly run out of hallway segments because those who are watching the series will remember that initially we made one, two, three, let me make this a little bigger so people can read it. We made four track segments. Our first one, we set a specific length, and then we auto-generated four more after that. So if we, if we just trim this down a little bit, just to make it a little more tractable, see that even more. See there that we've got our initial oops, we've got our initial segment and then a randomly generated segment after that. So the problem is, is we're advancing along. We've got the camera tracking the player and we're moving down the hall, but but we need some way to generate more and more track segments as we need them. And the other thing we need to do <clears throat> is assuming that somebody is really good at the game. If we don't delete the old hallway segments, eventually we're going to fill up memory and we're going to start bogging the game down. Now, in truth, for a game like this, most of the time that is not a concern. Uh, it's, if you've played any of the catch-up games from last year, like Bounce and um, or uh, who's the guy that did Flappy Bird? The, he did that one with the, the new game with the helicopter on the head thing where you're, you're trying to go up through this hallway and you keep running into stuff. Anyway, the point is, most of these endless runners, people are not going to... It's not endless. They get to like three or four whatever goals there are and they're done, right? The good people can do maybe a couple hundred or whatever, and then the rest of people just cheat and submit scores of 9,000 and pretend that they got it. But... The point is, is very rarely is somebody going to play this game long enough to fill up memory without, so they don't need to really remove track segments. That said, I'm going to teach people today how to do both adding new segments dynamically and removing segments once they're off screen. So let me put these initial segments back and we'll take a look at the code that does this. The code that handles this is uh, actually first Let's go ahead and look at game.lua. If we look at game.lua on line 72, you'll see a line here that says listen, enter frame, and then um, enter frame the, the function. So what this is going to do is I've got an enter frame function that gets called every time the frame has changed. So the game goes along. Uh, it does everything it needs to in one frame, and then it stops in a sense. It doesn't really stop, but what happens is, is there's a handoff from our code to the code that is run by Corona. Corona is moving things around, it's handling the physics, it's deciding on whether things need to be rendered, and that all happens between frames. So there's a frame stop, Corona does some work, and then it starts things up again and hands it back off to our code. That's, that's how the game loop works. And so every time a new frame starts, Corona puts out an event called enter frame. And the reason they do that is to allow us to make decisions and do things and detect changes since the last frame was rendered. So we use this, among other things, for our camera code. If you recall from last week, our camera code, every time the enter frame event occurred, it would say, where was the player last time? Let's move the world, the exact direct option. So if the character moved to the left 10 pixels, it would move the world, which contained all of the layers and the player, the other direction. So minus 10 pixels for the player, plus 10 pixels for the world. 
And so what that did was it kept the um, player in the center of the screen. So that's great for the camera, but another thing we can use enter frame for is, is we can check to see is it time to draw a new hallway segment? Is it time to remove all old hallway segments? So on line 72, I am re-enabling my code here. And let's go ahead and find the enter frame function definition. There it is. So on line 124 of game.lua, you'll find a function that has two lines in it. The first one is a call to a function within the wall module that says remove segments if needed. And the second one is draw segment if needed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uncomment the draw segment portion first. And we will take a look at that. And Ed, yes. not to interrupt your flow here, um, <laughs> in, in, of course, you've set how many frames per second are happening in, in the, config? the config.lua file. So it's already limited to this is going to happen 30 frames per second. That's right. Uh, I think we showed the config.lua earlier on in this, this uh, series. Well, I just wanted to revisit oh, no. that for people yeah. that might be wondering how often is this going to fire. Right, so this will fire. I've set this one up for 30, which is a, it's a good... Basically, in Corona, you have two choices, 30 and 60. Most of the time, I suggest people put it at 30 as a starting point and only ramp it up to 60 if they feel like they've got some kind of thing in their game where they're not seeing it's not smooth, uh, they need to, to make finer adjustments. I mean, it's really hard to talk to exactly the reasoning behind 60. But I say 30 because most of the time 30 frames a second is, is sufficient for a, a nice looking game or application. And if you've got a bunch of enter frame calculations or operations going on, the higher you put your frame rate, the more often that work is going to get done. And if you're working with a slower device and you're running at 60 frames a second and you're doing some really heavy duty calculations like a lot of 2D math or whatever it may be, uh, maybe uh, accessing the uh, persistent storage or, or something. You could bog down the slow people's devices and you'd think, oh good, you know, it's working great for my test device, but then 70% of the world who's running on slower devices will say, this thing is lagging out or it's slow, what's going on? And all you had to do was say, well, run it at 30 frames a second, it would have been fine. But you basically doubled your work by switching it up to 60. So I'm running at 30, which means that every approximately, there's it's not exact, frames are not, that's a, it's a good thing you brought that up actually. Side topic, one of the things that's really confusing for new users is when they hear frames per second, they say, okay, 30 frames per second, that means every 33.33 milliseconds there's going to be a new frame. And then they just say, okay, good. Then uh, I want my thing to move at this many pixels per second. Let me do the math, multiply, or divide, or whatever the, the operation is. Well, what they're not accounting for is that is not how it works. What really happens is every time Corona says, okay, stop working. It's my turn to do some work. Corona then says, okay, let's see. I got 10,000 objects on the scene. I got to move them around. I got to do the physics calculation. Basically, Corona will not let go until it finishes the work it needs to do in that inter-frame period. So you've got frame one, frame one ends. And then between frame one and frame two, there's a period of time when Corona is doing work. It's creating objects, destroying objects, cleaning up memory, doing some physics calculations, whatever your game or application is doing. And so, assuming that it can get all that work done before it's time to display the next frame. So if you can get it all done in 33.3 .3 milliseconds or less, you'll stay pretty much on track. But even then, there's factors involved here that keep it from being consistently the same duration. So when you're doing calculations on frame, you need to measure the time since the last frame and use that number. In fact, uh, Rob, I think, did an article on this last year that was a great article. And in a nutshell, you basically calculate the time it has been since the last frame, and you use that for your speed calculation or your movement distance calculation. And then, frame to frame to frame, assuming that your game is completely lagging out, 
you will see nice, consistent, smooth movement. At least it will be better than what uh, the naive approach would produce.